Khan, um, that says what we have over several years, because I started writing in 2009, a book called Before Forever After, and then it was published in 2017, and in 2018 formed an MPO with Malpi and Klangel, and in 2019 was running workshops, which um, um, Sharon has done, and they were intense. They were eight half-day workshops. And then along came COVID and eight half day in-person workshops with meditational music and craft activities did not cut the mustard. So we went into crazy mode during COVID. And, but what we have settled into now is four two and a half hour workshops, which are spaced days apart. And that's what I'm going to, I'm going to talk through. It's not a marketing ploy. It's just the easiest way for me to say, this is the breadth of what we found that if you wanted to create a good death and if you wanted to be living well, well, you know, like for me, the thing is, if I were to die tonight, what is it that's not ready? And Sharon Jansen will tell her, Helena still has clutter, right? And she doesn't want to die with clutter. So I'm trying to get my skates on, on that one. I've actually hired a declutterer as a birthday gift to myself. But here I am. I'm going to go into um, number five mode. So... Um, our strap line is, so live by design, finish strong. Um, there is a fabulous book called Finish Strong, written by somebody with 30 years of hospice experience, Barbara Lee Coombs. It is the most fabulous book. If you want to think about dementia and seven stages of the dementia and, and when, when, are, when are the conversations and what are the landmarks, um, and what you might do if you don't have assisted dying as an option, that's the book. And our thing is life-affirming conversations about mortality. Um, somebody said they, they um, Honey, you said that you talk about relationships all the time and you neglect the practical things. Um, I'm going to put forward that dealing with the practical things brings you to the edge of the relational conversations. Sometimes you think something's very practical and when you have that conversation, you deep into relationship. So we the four workshops that I talked about and the three themes are love, legacy, beauty. And each, as I talk about each workshop, I've highlighted where I think coaching tools come in. They're not Enneagram coaching tools, but I'm sure that everybody in this room has these tools in their coaching toolbox. So the first workshop is around living life well and taking stock, doing a life review and supporting yourself with self-affirmations, with self-care, with breath work. The second one is all around the medical choices and the living will and the people choices, you know, who will speak for you when you can't speak for yourself because you in a coma after an accident or something, hey? And who will be the guardians for your children? I, I once ran a workshop called Sudden Death and along came a couple and I kind of said, so imagine you are not going to arrive home tonight. Who is gonna take care of your children? And you know, there was a bursting into tears, right? They had not thought about guardians or anything. The, the third one is all of the boring and very necessary practical stuff of your affairs in order, whether it's having a will, whether it's money for the cash flow, because the bills don't stop coming when you've breathed your last breath. And what about your passwords, et cetera? And the last one I'm just bringing in, because it's the way we weave it, is that we, we, we look at rituals and what supports grief and resilience practices that will support you into your recovering recovering your equanimity i guess so loving self loving others the first one you'll recognize these coaching tools the wheel of life what's going well in your life what's going badly we ask people to say how important is this how much effort do you put into it, this role, and what's your level of satisfaction? So you, you're looking for teasing out a gap analysis. 
Then you can see this uh, bottom one here, relationship mapping and review. It's got four sections. Um, one section is colleagues, the other is family, the other is friends, and the other is other. And this came out of the work that I did with a breast cancer person because that was the four segments of her life. Her colleagues, her family, her friends, an other very South African situation, a domestic worker and a gardener who had worked for her for 20 years, and she wanted them to figure in her will and in her bequests. So they needed to be in the relationship map. We also asked people to say, how is this relationship? Is it good? Is it bad? Put O for OK, put a, put a triangle for if you want something to change. And that would take you into forgiveness work if that's appropriate. And we use the work of Archbishop Tutu, which is the Book of Forgiving. It's a, it's a beautiful book. And it's got many, many things in it that you can access and resource. And then, you know, you can't look after yourself. You can't look after others if you don't look after yourself. But the resilience work of, of Lucy Hone is around acceptance, hunting the good, and recognizing what are you doing that's hurting you or harming you. And it's, it's especially, especially important in, in the grief part. In the second workshop, which is around medical decision-making, we have actually introduced people to the 10 components of a thinking environment, Nancy Klein's work, and uh, particularly the component of information is very prevalent in this because lots of people don't know, like a lot of people would think that CPR is great. They watch a Grey's Anatomy and you see people boom, 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 getting up and walking. And actually that is a minority of people. That is drama. It's TV drama. And the failure rate is very high. So informed decision making means that you actually are familiar. You know, what's the difference between cardiac arrest and, and, and CPR? Uh, when should you consider dialysis? When would you not? So there's like eight, eight things that we've chosen that we think that you should be better, in, as well informed as you can be to make informed decision making. And Nancy Klein has this quote that making information with, without information is intellectual vandalism. <laughs> I've always liked that. Um, advanced directive, which is focused on the medical decisions as opposed to a living will, which would be much broader as to imagine a slow death and you fading. So that would say, where do I want to be? And do I want to be touched or don't touch me? I don't like other people touching me, etc. Your healthcare proxies, we'd recommend two. A lot of people automatically think that they will be next of kin. My husband is not my healthcare proxy. He will never be able to switch off that machine. My best feisty girlfriend is my healthcare proxy because she will take on the medical profession and say, she has a do not resuscitate, respect it. <laughs> and then some of you may want to do organ donation. Some of you may think that you're too old to do organ donation. Do you know that skin is the most valuable, biggest and a valuable organ, and it doesn't matter how old you are, the burns unit in the children's ward will love you for donating your skin. Making a video supplement, we try and get as many people to do a video on their cell phones that says, hi, I'm Helena. It's the 19th of March, 2024. You can see I'm really compostmentous. And I wanna to describe to you these are the way I imagine my last days. And this is what matters most to me. Um, who do you wanna have conversations with? So you'd go back to your relationship map and the resources would be the conversation project. I put it in the chat card. We have some vital matters cards to play a game. What's, val what's of value to me? What's important to me? Um, yeah. Um, the third one, we've got something called the purple file. It's a free download on our site and it's tedious. Um, I know people who've done two hours a week to, until they finished it, but at the end they've got part one is pre, you can see it's pre, 
That is like everything that everybody would need to know before you die. Do you want last rites, right? Is there some spiritual advisor who you would like to be around in those last days? Do you, like the Mandela daughter, have a list of who mustn't be around you when you're dying? The second part, post-mortem, you've taken your last breath. Now, what do you expect? You know, who's going to wash your body? Are you going off on a gurney? Um, what, is, what do you want to be dressed in? Uh, are you going to have a wake? Are you going to have like the Quaker ceremony where people talk about you? What's, what's going to happen? Then the part three is all of this practical stuff and who needs to be in the know? Where are things? Where's your passwords? Do the people who need to know know? And part four is not only cash flow planning, it's, it's okay, you died. And then as I, as I asked Cherise, okay, you seem to have a strong relationship with your animals. Uh, what's going to happen to your cat? Who's going to take care of that? And you cannot diminish animals in people's lives. My mother's last four words were two phrases. John, cat. Helena, flat. So I got the real estate. My husband got the animal. But those were the last four words that my mother ever wrote. And she had peace of mind because she knew that my cat-loving husband was going to take care of her cat. So this affair is in order. The legacy letters would be from the relationship map. The bequests would come from the relationship map, which many of you, I'm sure you do. If you're coaching in a corporate, sometimes you do a relationship map because you're looking at who people have got relationships with and what's the state of those relationships. So this is just using that coach, that coaching tool and transposing it for another use. And then that, that conversation review. So I find that quite often people didn't put their financial advisor or their lawyer on that first relationship map or their doctor. And so they've got to start adding in. And then um, the, this one here, affairs in order, guardian independence, financial power of attorney, wills, bequests, contacts, the officiants, the speakers, and your end of life wishes. So the last one, the reason I included it here is because I, I really like Lucy Hone's work on resilience, the three strategies of resilient people. And she has a great book called Resilient Grieving, which is one of the best books I've come across. But also as coaches, I think that many people on this call would recognize the power of ritual um, and the power of witness. And so it comes into this work. We send out customized documents. The Before Forever book has audio clips. And so we do a selection of those audio clips. There is one book that I've come across, The Enneagram of Death, helpful insights on people's grief, fear, and dying. I haven't, I was again teasing my mind this morning and kind of thinking, so was she a two? Was he an eight? You know, kind of, I. I didn't have the Enneagram styles of the people that I've worked with as they're dying. And so, but I can't see a correlation between what I think of people's Enneagram styles and the way that they are dying a slower death. What I'm seeing that matters more is how much work they have done and the conversations that they have. So are they accepting death as part of life? And, you know, the, there's, a, there's a story of Pa, and Pa is, has got a big extended family, and he's um, in hospital in Cape Town, and he asked to be taken out of ICU and into a ward where he can see the retinue of his, of his family. And he spends his days giving his grandchildren messages, having a phone call with Australia and telling the family that the next time his lungs fails, they're not to interfere. He's ready to meet his maker. And my close friend and her sister are sitting with him and they can see that he 
he's failing. And the sister, who's a nurse, immediately gets up to try and intervene. And the other sister holds her back and says, respect his wishes, let him go. But then you can see you've got the whole family on the whole page and they're all aligned. So I had questions because you are all Enneagrammers. And how might a person's Enneagram and identity maturation impact on how they engage with their dying? And how much do you think sociocultural norms override the Enneagram? And I think it'd be really interesting to have this discussion in another year's time when you've got your you've got new lenses on what you're observing in the world through um, a lens of dying, Enneagram lens of dying. And Julia said to me, oh, there's a book here. There's a book here. So maybe there's a book for someone. I'm not, I don't think it's a book for me, a book by me, but I would be, yeah, I would be fascinated now to, to hear um, how you how you think a person's enneagram and their maturation might impact on the way that they die. So, Sharice, can you do another breakout room? And this time you've got twenty five yummy minutes. Fantastic! Thanks, Elena. I'm going to copy the questions back into the chat room. Mm -hmm. Uh, there they are, question one and two, if you take note of that, and then I will pop you into breakout rooms. Let's bear with me. There's still six uh, rooms, Helena. Um, I don't know how many people there are on the call. Okay. Um, there's 24 going into the okay. room. So I would do four rooms. Okay. Just four rooms. Yeah. Okay. Six participants per room. Is that okay? Mm. Right. Here we go. And now I want to join a room. Correct. They are open and going. We'll see you in 25 mm. minutes. Can I assign you to a room, um, Helena? Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear a more in-depth discussion, and yet I... Yeah, I. What's the practice? Do the facilitators never join the rooms? You can. I've never seen. Julia. Yeah, we've done. We've not done it before, but I'm. I'm. I think you can. Um, and Anita and. I think I'm. Sorry, did you I'll invite? Penny is room three. Penny, you room three. And then Analita, have you received yours? Yeah, there she goes. Okay. Don't you join a room? Uh, not if I'm uh, part of the running the... Why don't you join a room? I will broadcast when time is up. Okay. Because you've got access to it, right? I've got access to it. Okay. Where yeah, I? I've just I've just tried it. I I can message all rooms. Okay, great. I'll join the room. I'll see you just now, Helena. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. So, oh, uh, just to let you know, Julia did say tomorrow morning at seven thirty mm -hmm. uh, we can chat, but she will be driving, so it's after school run. Right. Oh, that's lovely. Bye. So. Um, what we have, we have 20 minutes for groups to, so five minutes for each group to put into the field whatever they want to share with everyone on the group. 
And then we've got um, 12, 15 minutes for an open discussion. So Nsiki, can I respectfully say, let's handle that question, yeah, yes. in the open yes. discussion. Thanks, Thank hey. So uh, should we just go group one, two, three, four? Group one was Christo, Helen, Joe, Megan, Rob, and Samantha. Um, can you take your, your minutes and share with us what you discussed, please? Yeah, I agreed to be our first spokesperson here. Um, a few of the threads that came out was sort of a curiosity around um, the way an instinct might have a sort of, um, I'm using my hand because it feels like there's sort of this press of the stress of death and the 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 way that presses on our structure and the relationships and the um and the fear and the way that that can sort of enhance an expression of an instinct was something we were sort of noticing and also curious about and then in my own experience i've it just feels true the way that maturation can allow for more conversations. Um, I'm a type seven, my partner's a type seven, and I think in an unintegrated way, we would be af either afraid of conversations or run away from conversations. And I just notice in myself that the availability, just the allowance of those conversations and in my children and their experience of death, the way that I'm able to just allow them into those conversations and to engage with them without, I think what would be my normal instinct as a seven to move away, <clears throat> feels like it becomes available only because of my maturation. And then the other thing that we came upon towards the end of the conversation was um, the way this parallel sort between birth and death, the way that, that there's a, a, a state experience that feels has a parallel to it, but that with death, there's such a layer of a very reasonable layer of so much more responsibility and fear. And there's sort of a a press, a stress, but also a, some shame that can happen that um, there's such a parallel, but such a difference. So that I'm tracking to share. I would love to invite in other people in my group. <clears throat> It feels in a way you said it all, Megan, <laughs> very beautifully, even more than we spoke about. <laughs> Helen, I think you're muted there. Yeah, you have another minute, but we can add that into the discussion at the end, if that's OK. Um, so Group two, Andrea, Annalita, Cherise, Lawrence, Miriam, Sev, and Sharon. Okay, I'm the spokesperson that's been nominated by my team. <laughs> and um, I'm really glad that Megan or Megan, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Meg, went first. Um, we also had a, a, a bit of a discussion around the instincts. Um, I shared with, um, from my perspective, as a, 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 birth, a death doula working with terminated pregnancies and transitioning people, that what I had experienced with certain subtypes, Meg, is that there seems to be um, that pressure of death 
really works with the subtypes. So I shared an example that what I'm noticing, and I'm busy doing research at the moment, a lot of research. Uh, look out for the book that's coming um, to Julia's remark. Um, so what I tend to, to see as a pattern now, and it's only in the early stages, is that the social instinct seems to be wanting to be custodian of the system or the family when the death occurs or on, in an instance where a terminal diagnosis has been given, um, that the uh, that the, the the sexual subtype tends to get very expressive and very intense. Uh, I can speak as one who, who went into that space. Um, I also um, spoke about a self prez five who had uh, 16 IVF little ones in heaven and how she related um, and which wing they lean, they she leaned in was more of a four and wanting to do ritual and really connect to the expression and the connection with each little one, even though that little soul didn't manifest. So there were those stories we shared. Um, an Alita, Alnita, Alita, I can't, I can't remember how to pronounce her name, was in our group and she's type one. And Alnita, Alita, Lita, I'll just say Lita, forgive the spelling and the pronunciation, um, resonated with being a type one and really appreciating, Helen, what you shared about having a structure, alignment, a sense of how things will play out. Um, Miriam, I think Miriam was in our group. Miriam is a 2827 and Miriam resonated with the fact that although she had been very much in her two space and care provided a lot of care and holding for those who had transitioned and passed in her family she was very firmly you know leaning into her eight and very decisive about what she wanted to experience and how she wanted to experience it so that is very interesting and she feels that her eight in her triad really has come to the fore um um, Cherie, uh, oh, Lawrence was the only male and spoke about the cultural impact and significance from his experience. And it was very interesting because he was in a group with Megan, I, and I think one other person in an earlier group. And he spoke about the patriarchal, forgive me if I got this wrong, um, Lawrence, the patriarchal influence and the tribal or the cultural influence where you surrender your body and the and your um um the the uh the family and the tribe becomes the custodian of the process you surrender to that and even if you had five or six um children the older people in the tribe or the elders in the tribe or the process in the tribe that everybody knows all the community knows just follows that process and everyone knows that process and that um, for him to have a purple file or initiate a conversation might be seen as emptiness or um, challenging um, cultural norms or um, being seen as very weird um, is, that's my wording and then uh, Lawrence also um, said that for him it was just about surrendering to that cultural process that everybody knows and therefore he felt a little bit out of sorts in the group but at the same time I was quite curious to see how we were um, grappling with the topics and what came to the fore. Sharon shared that she was working very much on assumptions and I might get this horribly wrong because my dyslexic brain doesn't remember things in the correct order but I, um, what I am um, Sharon was alluding to is potentially the assumptions we could make around the types and how they might want to um, uh, relate or um, uh, uh, process or um, um, uh, action what might happen in the end days. And uh, we started surmising about obviously the one would want the structure, um, the three might want a really flashy um, a funeral with a fancy casket and all those kind of things. We made a lot of assumptions. Um, team, did I remember everything? Was there anything I've forgotten?
Oh, thank you, Andrea. Perfect. I think that's it from me. Helen, we'll chat some more. Okay, so room three was Anna, Beth, Kate, Lily, Penny, and Sarah Ann. Okay, so I'm, I think I'm jumping in here, but I'm sure the others will pick up. Um, we didn't talk about instincts. In fact, they didn't come. <laughs> um, what we spoke about was that it's it's a there's a complex interplay of things that um, affect how we engage with dying. The enneagram definitely um, seems to correlate in some way, and there were quite a few stories and experiences shared around particular types experiencing. And we extended it from the Enneagram being about how you live life, but extending to how you do death. How do you do life and how do you do death? And um, specifically some stories shared around Enneagram 7 and wanting to get the suffering over with and wanting to die and not have a funeral because, you know, that's, that's depressing and um, we don't want to do that. So definitely a correlation with the Enneagram. There was also the sense that, um, like an earlier, uh, a previous group has said that with later stage maturity, definitely more of an openness to conversations about death and dying. Um, yeah, so so we could see a clear correlation there. And then we, we also um, talked quite a lot about social, cultural, family norms and how those can sometimes trump the Enneagram or maturity. So it's almost like a, a fallback. I, I'm adding that in myself. It's almost like a fallback when we're in the process of dying. Suddenly, oh, but of course we're going to use the church to have a funeral and go through those rituals, even though the family is not particularly religious, is actually more spiritual. Um, so yeah, so the social cultural norms trumping all of that. And then, and then another thread, which was quite interesting was that in the, in the process leading up to the death, it's probably the person who's dying, whose who's maturity and Enneagram is leading the way. And once they have died, actually it's the people who are left behind who caretake the process that their Enneagram and maturity then dominates. Um, the process, even though, and then they lens it through, oh, but I'm sure mum would have done it this way or dad would have done it that way, but it's through their own lens. Um, yeah, there were many other aspects, but yeah, I think that hopefully sums it up, but please add in anybody if I've missed anything. Thanks. Um, room four, Abongili, Hani, Julia, Lemis, Nsiki, Trudy. I hope I haven't missed anybody. So I didn't think Dominic did the speak. <laughs> Um, so again, probably one of those practical things that I didn't look at, but I'll go for it so long and then anybody's welcome to jump in and fill in. So we also looked at some of those things that um, we just mentioned around the, the types having a particular propensity, maybe for certain parts of the conversation or avoidance. Um, but then we looked at this, whether we could say it is a matter of social norms overpowering or whether there's this dance between, somebody suggested maybe there's more of a dance between um, the extent to which um, social and cultural norms take root at this time. And um, uh, we, we, we explored how in different cultures there are set, so, so speaking from a, from a, um, Muslim cultural point of view, there's, there's certain set procedures that kind of make a lot of the things easier because it's already, in a sense, prescribed. And then, um, and they, so they'd anticipated. Um, and then on the other hand, there may be 
um, in other cultures where, as I think somebody else mentioned, you know, the whole community has a sense of what's going to happen, what's going to unfold. But then that may take away from the conversations that still do need to be had. So we spoke, we spoke about that um, quite a bit as well. And then, um, yeah, I don't know, I'm going to call on somebody else from the group to take over what I'm possibly forgetting. Nsiki? Julia? You're on mute, Julia. We did have a little bit of a chat on Enneagram and from our personal positions, um, told some amusing stories and trying to figure out if you've left anything out, but I think you've covered it, honey. Uh, we did speak about maturity, sorry. So with, with regards yeah. to maturation, we spoke about how even when it comes to dealing with matters afterwards, the degree of maturation allows for a higher level of seeing the situation and the capacity to hold more difficult conversations or engage more complexity. Um, definitely saw the maturation being a factor there. Um, mm -hmm. And then again, lower, lower levels of integration may be... Um, keep people avoidant or in reaction and defense. So mm. I think that's one of the things. Mm. Okay, so shall we go into open discussion? I'm going to jump off like three minutes to six because I've got a horrible meeting that I have to go to on building security and I'm chairing so I can't get out of it. Um, so Nsiki, uh, your question, do people know when they're going to die? So I, I find it a really interesting one because unless it's sudden death, people have a lot of choices. You know, um, there's that saying, let nature take its course. In our world where I've I think that many of us have medical aid and we have hospital plans, et cetera. Nature isn't given a chance to take its course. I mean, if you look at the sand people, when somebody was in decline, they had like a death lodge on the, the a special house hut on the outside of the village. And the dying person was in that hut and people went to have conversations and they went to say their goodbyes. And there was a state of mind that was emerging. But, you know, like, unless you are like the man I described in the hospital, Pa, I am ready to meet my, meet my maker and do not intervene, do not give me oxygen. I don't want anything. So he knew that his body was ready to die and he had to make sure that everybody else would allow him to. The, the, the quest of intervention by medical practitioners is, is, is very high. Um, I know of a 99 year old who had dementia, but in when she was 92 and she didn't have dementia, she did a do not re resuscitate order. Um, but then at 99, when she had a heart attack, the family panicked and they called the Jewish ambulance and the Jewish ambulance came and they successfully resuscitated the 99 year old who had dementia and which means that she's got a, what I call die twice. Um, so I'm not quite sure what informed your question, but a lot of people will know cognitively that if you didn't intervene, they would die. And, and that is part of the journey of acceptance is um, people deciding to retreat from intervention and let things happen and have comfort care. Um, it, it, was, it, was just in, in, mm, mm. it was just informed by curiosity of, um, of or trying to make sense uh, or um, 
of death maybe around me and people in my family. Uh, my aunt, um, she asked specific things and she said, I can't go like this and, and meet my mom. And, um, and then an hour later, she was gone, you know. And um, my my dad also said something along those lines while he was still fine, according to me, um, and went to hospital and he said, that's it. Now this is the end of me. And I was like, you know, it took a while before he left, but that was the end of, that that was the end of him being conscious and talking and planning and, you know, um so so other people also shared certain things that could allude that maybe people have this premonition of the fact that they might be dying or they are going to die so i was quite curious about that so there is a book by michael holmes he was a hospice worker male nurse who worked for 30 years in hospice he has written a wonderful gathering together of his obser observations over the years. The book is called Crossing the Creek, and it's a freebie. It's a PDF if you are not that long, maybe 40 pages. But he does get you to see what things you might observe, which will allow you to think, oh, the time is coming. The person may time travel that they go backwards and forwards and in time as though they are they are reliving and what has happened before becomes the present. Um, if, even if, and they haven't got dementia, when they're lucid, they're totally lucid, but there's these episodes of traveling. So my mom, for example, I got a call from the carer saying, your mom needs to see you. And then she said, your dad just died. And, and actually he died 28 years ago, but she was reliving that. And then the other thing is to see the people who've gone before you. And, you know, so I met X in my dreams last night, or you hear them calling out to a person mm -hmm. who they think they may re-encounter in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, Michael's book is a, is a beautiful read. Thank you. Helena. Mm. Sorry, I just want to say to Nsiki, um, I I dreamt my mom would die a week before she died. And two weeks before she died, she said, I have to go and see my family in Cape Town. And she came back and I knew something was, was wrong, but I didn't know what. And then she was diagnosed and four days later, she was passed. I also know of clients I've worked with with terminated pregnancies or stillborns. They knew the moment their child had died. It's like they had a sense that the life force had gone. Um, mm. So it's not uncommon that people have dreams or premonitions in my experience or what I've heard as well. Yes. Mm. Thanks, uh, um, Helena. I see there's one question in the chat box. Maybe it's the last thing we can do before we end. Um, Analita asked, is it normal to be jealous of those who went before me? <laughs> Say more would be my response to that one. <laughs> Analita, say more. Is she still here? I wonder if she's dropped off. Yes, I am. There you are. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I actually envy people who, are, especially now in these days, and the way that the, our country looks and the, and the way that people act against, towards each other and everything that happens around us, I feel some, sometimes I feel jealous of those who went before me. They, they don't have to sit and struggle with this. I, that's where my question is coming from. That sounds like a pretty reasonable perspective. I have to say, I kind of think, oh, I'm so glad I've just hit 70. Maybe I've only got 20 more years to go and that's enough. I'm so glad I'm not 30. <laughs> 
in this world, hey, in this world. And then I also kind of think, oh, I'm so glad that person died, like my husband, and that they didn't live long enough to see the deterioration because that would have been devastating. So <laughs> I, I have some empathy with your perspective. But not enough to want to speak up the forthcoming ending. <laughs> okay. Should we call it a day? Yeah, I think Thanks. so. Helena, thank you so much for this conversation and, and the space for everybody to share. Thank you for everybody shares. It's been such a revealing and um nurturing conversation um and yeah appreciate you being here and showing up helena thank you for, thanks so much for your time and everybody go well and take mm. care of yourself thank, thank you thank you thank you, thank you so much bye-bye